session on uh, muscles and joints uh, actually combines biology and engineering in the same talk. Uh, so with two different people, one biologist and one engineer. And uh, Kisa is starting us off. Thanks, every, uh, thanks, organizers, for inviting us to come and tell you about our work. Is, uh, is that mic okay? And uh, thanks to you all for, um, for coming. So I'm going to start, and I'm going to show a movie which probably all of you have seen. I'm going to show you a cheetah robot. Uh oh, I'm going to try. And then um, I'm going to show you a real cheetah. Oh, it says it cannot look at you. Oh, Darn it. I bet I don't have my airport camera. Um, okay, so maybe I'm not going to do that to save time, because I, I don't want to cheat my engineering colleague out of his time. But you've all seen the um, Boston Dynamics cheetah robot running at 18 miles an hour on the treadmill, and you've all seen cheetahs running across the African plain chasing down the gazelle, and you know um, that there's actually a pretty, whereas the cheetah robot is amazing, it's just an, it's an amazing example of compliant actuation. It's still far cry from the actual cheetah, which you know runs at 75 miles an hour across uneven terrain, never misses a step, and neither does the gazelle. And it's in the end brought down by the claws and the jaws of the cheetah. And 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 the the open question is, what can we do to um, you know going forward to make the robots more like the animals? And the, the topic of our talk today is to ask how um, we can improve muscle models uh, to, to uh, move toward that goal. Um, and uh, I want to tell you about our, a new muscle model that we developed recently and some of the implications for activation and control. So, um, so this is a sort of a, a, a neuromechanical loop, um, actually from the work of um, Tom Daniel showing a, um, a hovering moth. And we typically think of the brain as being the controller that sends the control, control signals to the muscles um, which actuate the body to move in the real world, producing kinematics and you know, aerodynamic or hydrodynamic forces, uh, leading to motion in the body, which produces sensory input that can be used for feedback control. And as many of the talks we heard previously mentioned, the gains in many of these parts, of the loop, or the time delays in many of these parts of the loop are quite different. But what I want to talk about is actually what are the properties of muscles that actually allow them to participate actively in the control of movement. And these basically focus on the nonlinear stiffness of muscles, energy storage by the muscles, and the combination of these <coughs> that leads to the muscle's ability to adapt intrinsically without um, input from you know, higher centers to changing loads during ongoing behavior. So the outline of the talk is, um, I'm going to tell you about muscles as motors and muscles in, as nonlinear springs, and I'm going to present to you our new hypothesis for, um, uh, or a new, our new model of muscle function. And then my colleague John Tester from Mechanical Engineering is going to tell you about some computer simulations and a bench model actuator that we recently built and are just beginning to test. And, He'll finish up uh, talking about some of the implications for actuation and control. So um, this slide just shows the, sort of a conventional model of uh, muscle contraction. You can see it's planar. And in this model, the myosin protein is the motor that, um, that steps along the thin filament to produce translation that results in the sort of the sliding filament um, movements that, that result in contraction of a muscle. And the last uh, 60 plus years of muscle physiology research has um, described the biochemical steps in this um, cycle, as well as the changes in the conformation of the proteins during this cycle. And, um, and the current uh, modeling approach that models this sort of sliding, uh, sliding filament swinging cross bridge theory is the hill type muscle model which has a contractile element, which would be the myosin motors, in parallel with a damping element and a parallel elastic element, connected to a series elastic element, and the characteristic and well-known length-tension relationship of the contractile element and the um, force-velocity relationship. 
Okay, and, and in general, um, and John, I think, is going to talk a little bit more about this, the problems with this pill type muscle model are that there's not enough length dependence and there's not enough energy storage. So it's actually also long known that muscles not only function as motors, but also as nonlinear springs. And this is actually a very simple and elegant experiment from Tom Sandercock at Northwestern University. Uh, back in the 90s that illustrates this property. So the experiment is to take a cat soleus muscle and activate it at different initial lengths and then lengthen it or shorten it at constant velocity. And what you see actually in the output of the force output of the muscle is that there's time dependence. So during the actual changes in length, um, if you look here, for example, in the stretch, the muscle is at first stiffer during shortening and then it softens. Uh, but in addition to the, um, the nonlinearity non during the actual changes in length, there's also a long lasting change in force output as the result of stretching, which is termed force enhancement, or a long lasting force depression after shortening. So we have these nonlinear time-dependent and history-dependent um, properties of muscle. And it's also long known, and actually, you know, I think there are um, several papers in the 1970s and 1980s um, that describe actually this, the role of this, not the contribution of this nonlinear behavior of muscles to motor control. So muscles um, become stiffer when loaded and more compliant when unloaded, and actually, these are some data from Nichols and Halk in the um, mid-1970s. And so this is, again, cat soleus muscle. And these black lines describe the envelope of changes in muscle stiffness during loading and unloading that are uh, observed in denervated muscle with no feedback control from the nervous system. And then this outer envelope describes the behavior when you actually have intact spinal reflexes, so an intact stretch reflex or an intact unloading reflex. And what they saw is that the early responses, so sort of in that, in that interval, you know, between um, when there's a, a, a perturbation and the 100 milliseconds before there's any proprioceptive or other feedback, the muscles are in control and they're actually quite smart and do the job quite nicely to, um, to, um, to stabilize the system. These early responses of the muscle are then reinforced by the slower acting reflexes, including the stretch reflex, unloading reflex, and several other uh, uh, sensory inputs that we heard about in the last session. So, um, so, so what we wanted was so what we did quite recently is that we um, uh, conceived of an alternative hypothesis that could account for this nonlinear behavior in muscles. And this is this little movie here, this animation, is a, a somewhat misleading caricature of the idea. So the basic idea is that the, the cross bridges are a motor that not only translates, but also rotates the thin filaments. And the um, Titan protein, which actually is part of the thick filament in the A band and part of the thin filament in the I band, um, must necessarily wind. Um, up on the thin filament as the cross bridges rotate them. And what's, what's kind of uh, misleading about this little movie is it actually shows a number of different rotations, but in, in actuality, um, our kinematic model suggests that the amount of rotation is somewhere between 60 and 270 degrees, so less than one full turn. And um, so rather than actually winding up the tighten on the spool, the function here is for this, of this winding is to modulate the elastic properties of the spring, if that makes sense. So let me just say that um, here's a, a sort of a, a cartoon of a muscle sarcomere. The green is the thick filaments that represent the myosin motors. The, um, the blue <coughs> is the thin filaments that represent the trackway that the, is translated by the motors as well as rotated by the motors in our hypothesis. And the Titan protein actually extends all the way from the, um, the M line to the Z disc. It runs through the six Titan proteins, run through the core of the thick filaments, and then they radiate out to attach to the thin filaments near the Z line. And, um, and so our hypothesis is that this Titan protein is a molecular spring with tunable stiffness,
enhanced storage and recovery for energy and is uh, largely responsible for producing this intrinsic adaptation to load perturbations. And I think it was, I'm trying to think if it was 2005, 2006 at the AM, AM meetings in, um, uh, in Cleveland, um, I told this idea to Andy Reina and he helped us to conceptualize this model of, um, of the winding filament hypothesis, which John uh, Tester is going to talk a little bit more about later. And oh my gosh, I'm really going full here. So, um, so let me just basically quickly say that um, Titan is an elastomer. So it's got, a, a, it's been described as a dual stage molecular spring with a very um, a low, for, a low force part, uh, the tandem immune globulin domains that extend under low force, and a, and a PEVK domain that extends under higher force. And so it's got this very long tail where there's very little increase in force when you extend an inactive sarcomere. And so the problem is that Titan is way too compliant um, in an inactivated muscle to be to provide that additional parallel, parallel elasticity that we need to make our muscle models better. Um, Leonard and Herzog showed in uh, 2010, actually, in single muscle myofibrils, um, some interesting results. And so what they did was they took a single uh, myofibril and they stretched it to really, really long lengths. And actually, this four microns here represents the length at which the myosin motors can no longer interact with the thin filaments because there's no overlap between them. And what they showed is, is that at these long muscle lengths, there's still a really big difference in um, stiffness between a passive or inactive myofibril and one that's been calcium activated, suggesting that there's a spring in muscle that's activated by calcium. And they further show that if you can digest that with digest the titan with trypsin, you completely eliminate um, uh, this spring element. So, um, but they, they didn't suggest a mechanism inside the sarcomere um, that could account for this. And so our hypothesis is a basically a two-step hypothesis. We first um, hypothesized that this N2A part of titan binds to the thin filament upon calcium activation of muscle, so it mechanically engages the titan spring, taking out the um, low force immunoglobulin domains so that just the high force PVK is always engaged upon active stretch. And further, that the myosin motors also wind the titan protein on the thin filaments, which also modulates their stiffness. So, sorry about that, John, I robbed you of your time. That's all right. <laughs> Um, so I am John Tester, and uh, I'm a mechanical engineer uh, at Northern Arizona University, and I started working with uh, Dr. Mishikawa about a year ago. And uh, well, one of the things we wanted to do is actually model this uh, winding filament uh, concept mathematically first, put in computer models, and eventually do a, an actuator out of it eventually. We're just getting started on that this year. And one of my things that I do is I'm a design engineer, and so one of the things, based on what you just saw, is what does an actuator need to have that incorporates these features? And so you look at it from the design parameters, and number one, which was um, discussed, was if you look at it in terms of mathematics, uh, the force in the system is related to both velocity and displacement. And so the load output uh, is dependent on only, not only these three factors, but also the sign as well. In other words, if you're putting a, a filament in tension and then put it in more tension, uh, the final resting value will be uh, a different uh, value than if you had it in tension and then gave it less tension. Uh, the settling value would be different. Another thing is variable stiffness control that's related to that. Um, and then you mentioned, you saw earlier, the very last thing was about having a system which would latch on to this Titan and then spool. So there's a clutch involved or a ratchet, if you will, at different locations on your spooling. And lastly, as a lot of people have talked about this already about energy storage by the muscles. Can we incorporate that at this base level? So just to review what we have just looked at here in terms of the conventional model, the hill type model, um, I never can use this very well. Uh, I'll just go ahead and just verbally point this out. In this case, for the Sandra Cock and the, uh, Harden, um, Henderson, or Hardman, one of the two, the experiments here, uh, the top set of curves on the top uh, right, top right from you all, shows where you have tension, and then you increase the tension, 
and then it settles in position. The FE uh, shows you the force enhancement results. But if you had it in tension and then release some of the tension and let it settle, you have a forced uh, depression. And so they sell at different positions. But if you use the hill type model here and simulate this, this is in, in uh, MATLAB basically by Dinesh Pai and Sang Hu Yao, you'll see that the settling position is the same. So that's a defect in this model. Now, if you use this blinding filament model that um, Dr. Uh, uh, Nishikawa had mentioned, had pointed out, uh, and you use these kinematics and dynamics associated with it, try to simulate that, what can we gain from that? And so here we look at the same situation for this uh, isovelocity experiment. And you do get these results that are history and time dependent. We haven't got the scale very well yet, but that's where we're at right now. And you'll notice the simulation on the bottom, in contrast to what we saw before, has an FE component in there uh, that's settling in if it uh, goes from uh, tension to more tension or extension to more extension. And it has a FD component if it goes from tension to less tension or from extension to less extension. So computer-wise, our uh, modeling work on the right track. So the next thing we do is put a bench model together, experimental model. And this looks nothing like a muscle initially, but on the other hand, a lot of the robots we're looking at look nothing like people. So I think we're okay, okay to start with. And uh, this is just to get an actuator idea and see if we can start replicating some of this. I can point out some pieces here. I tell you I get near the edge, but I can't use this, this laser pointer. So uh, spring A right here is that thin titan that was stereotyped. And spring B represents the serial elastic element, or SC, on the far end there. And this little sled that we've developed, it's not this big, it's about like this. And it slides along the linear bearing. We're just looking at the actual motion here. Uh, the ratchet that we're discussing, that was the N2A little knob on the Titan that latches in place, or ratchets in place, what I call a clutch, is represented by the servo right in the center of this, this device. And we've separated the spool that you saw in the previous uh, schematics here. This spool and ratchet device, it does two things. It latches on and it spins. We broke that up physically in terms of this device, at least for this initial model. So the spool is actually in this other picture. It runs off a page here, but over here on the bottom, there's a simple DC motor with a pulley on it. And so basically what's going on is that's the spool part, and then the central sled servo has a ratchet on it. And that collectively is the ratchet. Um, not, not simulated is a varying CE. We just simply say when we start the experiment, there's no contribution there uh, with the experiment initially. So I did some experiments on this device just to see if we can get the same characteristics of curves. And looking at this, this is similar to what we saw before from Sandercock, where you had uh, extension going to a lower level of extension at different start values and end values and having an uh, isovelocity uh, change in length. And then the results are over here on the right. And then Sandercock and Heckman is at the top just for comparison. And you can see that we do indeed get this, uh, this relationship that looks similar in terms of curve to the, to the uh, nonlinear uh, stretching. And then you have a settling of some FE on the tension side to less tension. And on the bottom, uh, when you go from to the tension to more tension, on the bottom, less ten uh, a lot of tension to less tension, FD. The scale's not right, we're still working on that. But nevertheless, we do see the characteristic curve settling in different positions, depending on uh, how you're working the model. Now the next thing, which we didn't show you right away, was there's other experiments that you can look at. Um, and one of the ones that Dr. Nishikawa brought up is right over here, where you do have activation, where you have uh, no activation here, and you do have activation here on the thin lines. And we tried simulating that just initially with this, this model. And you can see some of the characteristic shape of the curves when we do have some activation along with the, uh, the ISO velocity experiment, experiment here. Um, we're, I, we can't really characterize that that's exactly precise to any level of degree, but we're getting the shape of curves we want. So, implications. In the near term, we're trying to work with uh, at least a couple of companies, um, startup companies, small companies, to implement solutions in real uh, prosthetic devices uh, for, uh, for application where they have actuators and they use a state-based model uh, in terms of control to determine a walking situation. And uh, we want to uh, simplify these state-based models and enhance them at the same time uh, with this uh, non-heel type model, if you will, the winding filament uh, concept.
And uh, ultimately what we'd like to do is have an integrated simulator of artificial muscle, muscle actuator, all in one word or all in one breath, I said that. So, uh, but basically have all these properties we've been talking about today, intrinsic feed forward control, uh, and have intrinsic physical properties to handle the fast load changes. One of the things about this is, and one of the reasons uh, Dr. Mishikawa started looking at this was how muscles can deal with uh, external load inputs quickly, quicker than the brain can send information to them. And so um, we're hoping that'll take care of some of this and then have feedback control from loads, uh, length of force inputs to these actuators. So this is a long-term thing, but we think we can do some of this in software in the short term. So this is our acknowledgments for a lot of people working on this. We deal with a lot of undergraduates and graduate students. I will point out that uh, uh, Kit Wilkerson is in the audience here. He's done a lot of work with this and he'll be moving on to more graduate work. So that concludes what's going on. Thank you for your, uh, for your attention. Questions uh, in the back there. In your cartoon of this uh, muscle actuator, your fantasy actor, what does that look like to you? Are we talking about a, sort of a motor that indicates stuff or fancy mechanical design? So the bench model was meant to look. You know, the bench model was meant to really um, be inspired strictly by the. Um, winding ratchet model. So the, you know, the motor represents the cross bridges and the springs are all, you know, oriented in the same way with respect to the motor. Um, and the bench model we can use to do a lot of biological experiments. So we can ask, for example, what would happen if you take out this spring or make that one stiffer or, you know, um, so we can, we can, uh, have a physical model that we can compare, you know, experiments to the real biology with using that, but it's not meant in any way to be something that you'd ever use in a real prosthesis. So actually John's job in the project is to take those concepts, you know, take the concepts and, and do the engineering to make them into something, you know, that has like, so these are, these are sort of the biological, um, design parameters, but there's a lot of engineering design parameters, you know, like efficiency and weight and noise that um, ultimately, you know, we want to design something that, that would ultimately really be useful in a prosthesis. But will, step one is to do the software, so I think. That's all right. I will, I will emphasize, though, from an engineering point of view, I want something physical as well. And uh, I don't see the actuator looking much different from what actuators we're using now in linear actuators. Um, I think the, the, the trick is going to be develop some materials that have properties that are tunable. And when, when you hear that, you hear the term smart materials if you've worked in that area at all. Right now, smart materials are too slow to take care of all this curve. Um, they're just too slow to take care of either one side of the, uh, the reaction or the other, either the, the slope or the, the, you can't do both with smart materials that we have right now that are effective. Um, but we're trying to find some ways to trick that to make it work. So that's where we're heading next. So, so this gets at the question of how can you test the idea biologically. And the problem is, is that the, the diameter of the Titan filament is two nanometers. So it's absolutely drowned out by just the, the reflection from the other larger filaments and it's invisible in x-ray crystallography no matter how much you enhance it. Um, so, um, so you can't use x-ray crystallography to test the idea. NSF does have um, a program, actually, it's a multidisciplinary program to try and increase the resolution of biological imaging. And one of the projects that they're actually looking at is using a quantum dots to actually try and see whether this is occurring in living cells in a, um, a, a confocal microscope. Um, but the technology to get the quantum dots where you want them and keep the tissue alive is probably like five years out. I should say that uh, you had discussed this a little bit, giving us an indication about the winding aspect. Right, right. You know, I would say that there is uh, a lot of evidence. I didn't, I didn't have time to tell you the evidence, supporting evidence for the model in the talk, but there you can see, um, actually, um, 
changes in sarcomere structure. This is actually electromyograms of um, like a transmission electron microscopy of the um, alpha actinin that holds down the thin filaments and the Z disks, and you can actually see that the changes in orientation of the alpha actinin are um, uh, consistent with rotation of the thin filaments. And most people who do three dimensional modeling of uh, and spatially explicit models of sarcomeres um, would agree that there absolutely has to be some rotation of the filaments when that's okay. So the question was, uh, we mentioned that it was loading and unloading uh, will stiffen or more make more compliant. How do we do that, basically? Yeah. That's the big question, right? Yeah. Well, so, <laughs> so, so in our bench, mo our bench model has that property, right? And the question maybe is, where does it come from? And why isn't it in the Hill model? Does that answer your question? So, and the, re the, the, the thing about the model is, so, so, so in the winding filament model and in the bench model, when you extend the, uh, you know, when you apply force and change the length, you store energy in the tightened spring, and when you shorten it, you're able to capture that energy. And the problem with the Hill model is that because the element is in series with the, um, the contractile element, um, the, the length response is in the, the force response of the SE is indirect through the CE, which has a very shallow force length relationship and a very weak PE. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.